Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another one of our conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. As you know, this is a, a, um, a webinar where we're going to discuss Lyme disease. And our discussion is based on the questions you ask. So I'm always interested to see what you have in store for me. For those of you that are new here, welcome. And I'm glad to see a number of familiar names on my message board as well tonight, too. The way you participate is two ways. Number one, you can listen to the questions and see what responses I give to them. If you are actually participating in the live version of the webinar tonight, not the recorded version, but the live version, um, you'll actually see that I'll post the, the messages on the screen as I read them, but I will read them because they don't show up in the recorded version. Uh, the other way you can participate is uh, to ask a question. And the, the way that you do that on the bottom right-hand side of your computer is a chat box. And you can write your question to me there. Uh, the thing I ask is do not hit the enter key until the whole question is complete. Literally write your question as one big long run on. Um, if you actually click the enter key as you're writing it in, it sends a separate question to me and that gets to be hard for me to uh, trace from this side. As usual, I am creating a recording tonight. And my intention, if everything goes well, is to have an email sent out to you tomorrow morning before 930 in the morning, uh, announcing that that recording has been edited and ready for you to take a look at. I will be doing that editing later tonight and writing a synopsis of the webinar tomorrow morning. Um, so if everything goes as planned, <laughs> that's what that will be happening here. OK. Uh, tonight, uh, you know, we're doing this webinar on Wednesday. Typically, I try to go for Thursdays. Um, next week, we will have a Thursday webinar. We'll be back to Thursday night again. Um, long term, I'm reevaluating. I may start moving my webinars to every Wednesday night. I'm still trying to decide about that. It seems to be, it seems I'm starting to have a lot of conflicts on Thursday evening. So um, we'll see how that goes. Okay. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, I think that kind of takes care of everything. Um, let's go ahead and get started with the first question here. Oh, one last thing. So usually there's too many questions for me to answer. OK, so if I don't get to your question, it doesn't mean I didn't I purposely tried to avoid you. It just means that I didn't get there. OK, um, although it looks like tonight we may have a slightly lower turnout than typical. So sometimes on those nights I can't get through everything. So we'll see what we can do. OK. All right. So here's the first question. Hello, Dave. Was hello, Dr. Ross. Do mold binders also bind to antibiotics? Also, what are your thoughts regarding the current flu shot and new COVID booster? Should we get them? Thank you. All right. So, Dave, um, in terms of binders, um, so binders are things that we use to um, sponge up or bind up fat soluble toxins. And in this situation, we're usually talking about binding up mold toxins that work their way. Uh, from your blood to the liver, the liver then moves them out into the intestines, still in a fat soluble form and out in the intestines because they're fat soluble, they get reabsorbed back into the intestines uh, or into the bloodstream. Uh, but if we use something that binds fat substances up in the intestines, it'll hold on to those mold toxins so they don't get reabsorbed, okay? Keep in mind, 25% of people have a problem where their immune system does not break down mold toxins in the blood, and then the liver takes them, moves them out into the intestines, and they get reabsorbed again. And mold toxins in your bloodstream inflames you, basically, and gives you a picture that looks a lot like Lyme disease, okay? So binders, meaning we're, we're using substances like uh, bentonite clay, um, charcoal, silica, um, cholesteramine, um, to actually hold on and fix your... Um, uh, your fat-based toxins, your mold toxins specifically, okay? So in theory then, any antibiotic that has some kind of fat solubility would p possibly be bound up by your antibiotics. And because I, I've i never um, fully clear on which ones are the most soluble, which ones are not fat soluble, I usually tell my patients to avoid taking any medications, including antibiotics, with their binders. And my guidelines are, when I tell people the, about the timing of their binders, is to stop all of your med all that's all, of your medicines and your supplements beginning 30 minutes before you take your binder, and you can resume taking them two hours after your binder, and you should be pretty safe with that, okay? Um, in terms of timing of when you eat, um, you can actually eat any time in there, but the most ideal time to eat uh, would be uh, have something, anything, a small amount of something, about 30 minutes after you take your binder. 
And the reason that's an ideal time to eat is when you eat, it causes your gallbladder, which um, collects all these toxins that are processed by the liver, um, it, it makes your gallbladder squeeze and, and, and spray out the toxins into the intestines. And that's so when you eat, 30 minutes when you eat, that causes gallbladder contract. And if you wait to eat 30 minutes after you take your cholesterol, it will have worked its way in those 30 minutes down to the part of the small intestines where the gallbladder squirts its stuff out, basically. Okay. All right. All right. In terms of the flu and the COVID booster, um, I just did a quick perusal of some of the questions earlier tonight. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to flip over to a question by Jim, which is in the same vein. Okay, so let me get rid of yours, Dave. And I'm going to post Dave's here. Dave raises some good points in his question. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, Jim raises good points in his question. Um, so hi, Dr. Ross, thanks for doing these great webinars. You're welcome. Let's see, do you think Lyme patients should get flu shots this year? There was a lot of talk about Australia's flu season being really bad this year, but it seems it tailed off quite a bit. I read the Australian Health Department's assessment in its last flu report and now the flu season there is just about over. It said flu has had a mild to moderate impact in Australia this year. Also, do you think Lyme patients should get the bivalent um, COVID booster? Okay, so let's talk about flu first, and then we'll talk about um, the uh, the new uh, bivalent uh, COVID booster. So, in generally, um, when people have Lyme and they get a flu vaccine, they use uh, many people will have declines in how they're doing with their Lyme, and it could take a month, two months, or more to recover from the decline that you get when you get the flu vaccine. Now that's an observation that many of us have that treat Lyme disease. And um, there's no science that backs that up, but that's what we see, okay? Now, keep in mind with any vaccine, what you're ultimately doing is weighing out the risk and the benefits, okay? So the risk of getting a flu vaccine is that your Lyme symptoms may worsen for a period of one to two months. That's the risk, okay? The risk in not getting the flu vaccine is that you get the flu. All right. I mean, that, that's a pretty clear risk there. Okay. Now, and one factor to consider as you're weighing out your various risk is the flu vaccine in any given year work, has a chance of helping you that's 50% or less. It only works 50% of the time. All right. So you, you're going to, if you get the flu vaccine, there's a good chance you're going to have a decline in your health for something that only works to really prevent uh, the flu. 50% of the time, <laughs> okay? So just keep that in mind too, okay? Then the other thing we can look at, and this is the point that Jim is raising, is the flu that we get in the Northern hemispheres um, comes out of the Southern hemispheres, okay? So if Australia and, uh, and the countries of South America um, have an easier flu season, that usually means we're gonna have an easier flu season up here as well too, okay? And uh, so what I usually advise my patients in any flu year, even if it looks like it's been a bad year down south, is I advise them to not get the flu vaccine, but I explain why and you know let them weigh out their risk and benefits, okay? Now, there are, um, but then I also advise them that if we get into the flu season and it starts appearing that we have a killer flu year happening that no one anticipated, that changes their balance and maybe they should consider getting the flu vaccine then, okay? So it's all about, weighing um, your risk and benefits, basically, okay? Now, there are a few people um, regarding the flu vaccine that have Lyme that I still would suggest get the flu vaccine, regardless, okay? Regardless of what's happened in the South. Um, those are people that have diabetes, because um, diabetes, um, if you have that, can potentially lead to a worse outcome from the flu. And people that are 65 of years of age and older tend to have a worse outcome from the flu and they're ones that may want to consider getting the flu vaccine as well too, okay? All right, all right. So then in terms of um, the COVID vaccine, the, again, this is one of weighing out risk and benefits, okay? So as many of you know, um, I have supported getting the COVID vaccines, okay? And I, <laughs> I, as I say that, I can only imagine the anti-vaxxers coming after me countless times again, but I have been on the side of saying, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Now I have to acknowledge that um, there are people that had some adverse reactions, but on the whole, the majority of people, whether they have Lyme or not, 
did not get adverse reaction from the COVID vaccine. And especially early um, in when we started doing these vaccines, when COVID was killing people right and left and causing marked hospitalizations of everyone, I thought at that time that the risk of getting COVID outweighed any risk for the average person, even the person with Lyme, from getting the COVID vaccine. Okay, now, the new COVID vaccine, so having said that, the new COVID vaccine um, is designed to treat not only the original strain of COVID, but some of the new um, Omicron variants that are out there, okay? So presumably it's a better match to what the type of COVID is that's out there, okay? So then let's start thinking about risk and benefits again, all right? So if you've had COVID, or if you had the vaccine, or if you had COVID and the vaccine, like I did, I, I had both, all of those, um, you know, the longer you are away from when you got COVID and the longer you are away from when you had the vaccine, the effects of that vaccine wears off, okay? All right. And so, um, so it makes sense to think about revaccinating, okay? Now, we are heading in your considerations, you have to keep in mind that we are heading into the period of time when we're all going to start living indoors more and socializing more indoors, potentially putting ourselves in situations where we may have contact with COVID. There still is quite a bit of COVID out there, okay? It is true because many of us have had the vaccine and many of us got COVID already that our ability to withstand COVID may be better than it would have been a year, year and a half ago, but it would even be better if we were vaccinated, okay? So, Having said all of that, I think you have to weigh out your own risk and benefits, okay? So if you are a person that had the previous COVID vaccines and boosters and generally tolerated them well and were not left with any lasting harm from those vaccines, and that's the majority of people, frankly, even with Lyme, that's the majority of people, okay? Then I think it, um, I think it, it, it makes sense that you would consider getting the bivalent vaccine I would suggest you talk it over with your individual doctor, though, who knows the ins and outs of your healthcare best, okay? If you are a person, though, that has been harmed by the COVID vaccine before, and again, it's a small percentage, even with Lyme, that's a small percentage, then I don't know that it's a good idea for you to get it, okay? So those are the considerations. Myself, I'm going to be getting the bivalent vaccine, um, and you um, I will, I'm making plans to get it within the next week or two, actually. So, and the reason I'm doing it is I want to start working out in the gym again. Um, I, I've been doing most of my athletic exercise outdoors, but as we move into another season, rather than working out alone in my apartment, I would like the social experience of working out with others. So I'm doing it so that I'll feel safe going or safer um, going into the gym, basically. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that question, Joan. And uh, good luck to you. Hello, Lynn. Hi, Dr. Ross. For cytokines, inflammation, and mast cell activation syndrome, which is MCAS, everyone, some people recommend quercetin and luteolin. You've talked about quercetin, but I haven't heard you talk about luteolin. Do you have a preference for quercetin? Can you talk about how the two differ? Also, I'm having a hard time comparing the relative activity of different forms of quercetin. For example, how strong is quercetin phytosome or isoquercetin compared to regular quercetin. Okay, so, um, so Lynn, um, so I actually, do, I, I, I do recommend both quercetin and to consider luteolin, okay? And in, in my written materials, my written article about mast cell activation syndrome, I suggest both, but I suggest starting with quercetin first. And if you don't get a good enough response out of it within a month or two, then consider adding in luteolin, okay? So everyone, both quercetin and luteolin are what are known as bioflavonoids. Um, and they're different types of bioflavonoids, but bioflavonoids um, have the potential of stabilizing what are known as mast cells. Mast cells you can think of as being the allergy cell, although we know they're much more than allergy cells now, okay? Classically, we think, we think of mast cells as being the things that pollens and cat dander land on and it causes them to activate, make histamines and release histamines and you get that whole allergic reaction, all right? What we now know though, is that infections turn on mast cells as well too, so that they overproduce and more easily release histamines, all right? 
And so things like Lyme, things like too many yeast in your intestines, all right. Also, mold toxicity can turn them on to be overly active and release their histamines, okay. Now, in addition, when those mast cells get turned on, they dump all kinds of cytokines out as well too, okay, all right. Um, so that generally, my starting point when I'm trying to work with herbal options, uh, things I try to have my patients do, number one, de-stress. Do any activity you can to pull to decrease your stress. Stress and anxiety are some of the biggest activators of mast cells, okay? Number two, get your infections under control, get your mold toxicity under control because they stimulate um, uh, mast cell activity, okay? Number three, um, if you have um, food sensitivities and food allergies, remove those things that are triggering you because they're turning on your mast cells as well too, okay? All right. Number four, add in a mast cell stabilizer, okay? And that, and you could, I usually advise people starting with quercetin at, for an adult at 500 milligrams three times a day. If you do that, and with one or two months, you're not having much benefit, then I would consider adding luteolin 100 milligrams three times a day, okay? Now keep in mind, luteolin, the major form that's out there, the best product out there is a product called Neuroprotec, and Neuroprotec has luteolin with um, a small amount of quercetin and a small amount of um, something called rutin. And rutin is in there to help increase the absorption, okay? In terms of potency, um, I find quercetin's a little bit stronger, but luteolin in some people works better, okay? Now, Regarding your question on quercetin in the different forms, the issue with quercetin is you want to make sure it gets absorbed, okay? And uh, quercetin phytosome basically means it's a liposomal form of quercetin. It's, micro, it's wrapped in with fat to increase its absorption. In terms of isoquercetin, um, I'm not familiar with that form, so I can't make a comment on that. I use this quercetin phytosome by Thorne, uh, which has better absorption than regular quercetin, okay? So that's what I would say there, okay? Um, yeah, I think I answered your question. Let me just do a quick screen share. I'll show you my whole article on mast cell activation where I lay out additional steps you can take, including prescription medicines to help with it as well too, okay? So let's see here. All right, so this is my Lyme information site. Here's my Lyme guide where you can read about most problems you might have in Lyme disease. And you can look in the immune system section, okay, to find my mast cell article, or you can just go up to the search bar here and type mast cell. All right, and so this is my mast cell activation syndrome and Lyme article, all right? And in here, again, I talk about what you do, remove stress, decrease the things you're allergic to, treat your infections, remove your toxins. One additional step I should have mentioned is lower the cytokines that are produced by those mast cells, that's the curcumin. And then you wanna do things to um, block histamines, all right? So you can use antihistamines, I talk about that here. But finally, you wanna stabilize your mast cells, okay? And you can either do that quercetin, um, or the luteolin. Generally, I start with quercetin first and then work into luteolin if it's not working well enough, okay? All right, so anyhow, there you go. All right, hold on here, everyone. Bear with me just a minute, guys. All right. Um, good luck to you, Lynn. Hello, Shanna. Let's see. I think I heard you say to take probiotics once a day, two hours away from antibiotics, either before or after. I feel like I have to take it two hours after each antibiotic dose based on my assumption that each antibiotic dose will kill all good and bad bacteria. So it negate the probiotics and probiotics are taken before antibiotics. Um, where is my thinking off? So Shanna, there's no precise way here. Okay, what I try to advise people to do is to take your um, uh, probiotics as far away from your antibiotics as you can. So you decrease any chance 
of um, killing them, okay? Now, if you happen to take your antibiotics two hours after your probiotics, those probiotics that you took will have worked their way down into the small intestine and start populating down there, okay? So you are, I'm sorry, large intestines will have started to, to populate further downstream, if you will, and you get benefit from it. You are, I mean, we're all correct. Whenever you take antibiotics, you decrease some of the effectiveness, um, but in general, you're still gonna get benefit, okay? It becomes really difficult. Um, I, I think this is probably the third, I think you've written me questions before about this, trying to be very precise about this. I would say, stop trying to be so precise. To just take it as far away as you can. The, the, you could, uh, and, and you're going to have the best outcomes you could take as far away as you can. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you. Hello, Heather. Hi, Dr. Ross. I keep reading about people taking fluconazole for Bartonella and it helping. Is this a new thing? And how does it work? Do all azoles help Bartonella? Thank you for doing these. So Heather, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I um, About nine months ago on my own, <laughs> I started adding fluconazole into my treatments. And this is without any discussion with my colleagues or knowing that other people were doing it too. So I think a number of us started toying with the idea um, around the same time. But what the idea is, um, about three years ago, Johns Hopkins University um, did some uh, laboratory experiments. Uh, Dr. Ying Zhang in his lab at Johns Hopkins did some experiments looking at what can we use to treat uh, both growing and persister Bartonella, okay? So in the laboratory, they grew Bartonella that was growing and some Bartonella that was persisting. And in their experiment, they took one representative drug of, of each major antimicrobial family and tried it to see what would it do with growing and what would it do with persisting Bartonella. So for instance, for the tetracyclines, they use doxycycline. And for the family of antimicrobials called macrolides, they used azithromycin, not clorithromycin, okay? For the azoles, they chose clotrimazole, not fluconazole, which is diflucan, and not itraconazole, for instance, okay? Not metronidazole, for instance, okay? Those are all azoles. And what they found is clotrimazole did a great job, a really good job of killing growing and persisting Bartonella. The problem is clotrimazole is only available in creams and is really not well absorbed. Now, I know there's some pharmacies like Hopkinton Pharmacy out in Massachusetts started um, uh, creating uh, liposomal forms where they would mix it with oil to try to increase its absorption. But the truth is we have no studies that show that clodrimazole compounded with oil is, is absorbed. We just don't know, okay? What we do know is that azoles like fluconazole, which is diflucan and itraconazole are absorbed, all right? So I started adding those into my treatment. And uh, in fact, my uh, Bartonella um, guideline about different antibiotics you can use has been updated to reflect that as well, too. And I think I updated maybe a month or so ago. I, I updated because I'm, I'm writing my, um, um, will soon be publishing my new book um, called Hacking Lyme Disease, uh, an action guide to wellness. I just handed it off to the editor today. And um, I'm waiting to get some artwork done for the, uh, the copy too. Basically, it's um, a compendium of key articles from um, my Treat Lyme site, okay? Um, it's an expansion over my previous book, That Anti-Germ Action Plans. But as I was putting all these articles together, I was also updating all of them too, because I wanna make sure that in my book, it's the absolute latest, okay? And so it, I have updated my Bartonella article to reflect using fluconazole. And I'm seeing some really good benefits in my patients. There's um, some of my patients that this has given them some of the best mental clarity and some of the best health they've had in Bartonella compared to anything, compared to um, doing Dapsone therapies, compared to doing rifampin-based therapies, um, compared to doing even methylene blue, okay? Uh, the other big game changer I have seen in managing uh, Bartonella in terms of persisters and growing Bartonella is methylene blue, um, which is a compounded medication uh, that was designed originally to treat um, another type of medical problem where hemoglobin doesn't release its oxygen. And uh, that methylene blue bumps oxygen off the hemoglobin so people can oxygenate their tissues. But we know from lab experiments that it can kill germs as well, too. 
And so that's another option that I have found helpful in people that are getting nowhere with their Bartonella treatments. But I would put Diflucan, Fluconazole, or Itraconazole in the same camp. I, I think they're doing a great job, okay? So let me show you my article or even talk about dosing that I've been using and to show you that I have updated that as well too. All right, so take a look in my infection treatment plan section. Okay, and this is my Bartonella guide. And it looks, I guess it was in April. <laughs> Boy, I feel like I've been updating my book for a long time. Yeah, so anyhow, I started, I did this update in April and in it um, is, you'll see, I list out tier one options. And so I list a variety of things that you can do, but one of those would be a treatment using fluconazole plus azithromycin plus cinnamon clove oregano. Okay, I'm finding that to be helpful. Um, you can use fluconazole plus cinnamon clove oregano and, and minocycline or doxycycline, okay? And what I would also let you know that if you cannot do a fluconazole, itraconazole also seems to be working well for my patients as well too. Okay, all right. All right, uh, thanks for that question, Heather. Hello, Doug, Dr. Ross, thank you for the miracles you produce every day in these terrific webinars. Wow, I appreciate that, thank you. Let's see, um, I have two questions. One, what do you think of the multi-peptide ELISA tests for Lyme? Also, I know many uh, doctors like yourself rely on real-time or Great Plains lab urine tests for mycotoxins. I've seen a heap of criticism about urine tests for mercury and that they don't reflect body burden. Rather, they only show how good one's body is able to excrete the toxins. Could the same be true as to urine tests for mycotoxins? And what do you think about my MycoLab blood tests for mycotoxins? I wanted to uh, pressure test this as I'm getting different views from different doctors on how to properly test mycotoxins. All right, so, um, so you know, I learned things in these webinars, okay? So I wasn't aware of my MycoLab having a, um, a blood test for mycotoxins. I'm gonna have to look into that. So I can't comment specifically about their test, okay? It is true that Great Plains Lab and um, uh, real-time labs rely on a urine test. So that is tied to your ability of your kidneys to excrete the toxins. And sometimes when people are early in their mold detox or they haven't even started detoxing, because of the buildup of toxins, some perhaps it's possible that in some, their ability to even pee out the mold toxins may be impaired. Um, and so maybe we're missing some. My practice experience has been though that um, if somebody is really sick, even when they are impaired, they're still gonna be able to pee some out. And sometimes what you'll see is when people, as we start detoxing them, when you get their repeat test, say four months later, that they're even peeing out more mold toxins. And that doesn't mean that they're doing worse. It just means that as we pull some of those toxins out, that their, um, their kidneys may be able to excrete more of those mold toxins, okay? Um, so I, I would say I need to study a little bit more about my micro lab, okay? I, I don't know how to respond to that question. In terms of the multi-peptide ELISA test for Lyme, um, that is another one I need to look into. Generally, though, ELISA testing um, is not perfect for Lyme and, and can um, find false positives, but also will miss active members. We tend to think of ELISA testing being more for screening tests, okay? Um, this one I'll have to look into a little bit more as well, too. My The test I rely on for making a diagnosis of Lyme actually is the immunoblot through Igenix. Um, that test looks to see if you have antibody reactions against eight different kinds of Lyme germs, including European strains. And in addition, um, its sensitivity, the ability to find Lyme when present is about 95% based on their validation studies. And I'm, I'm extremely doubtful that uh, a multi-peptide license is gonna come close to that, okay? But I do, I do need to look into that. So I'll take a look into that, okay? 
All right. Thanks for that question, Doug. Actually, let me write some of these things down here real quick. So, you know, the one thing I enjoy about doing these webinars is sometimes you all discover stuff well before I discover it, too. Uh, I know a lot of people are on the various boards and sometimes things slip by me that you're able to find. And so I do learn um, and I do look into things. I investigate them a little bit more. But this one I'll have to look into. All right. Thank you, Doug. Hello, Mosby. Can Lyme disease cause elevated CCCP, I'm sorry, CCP antibodies? I have a negative Lyme test, Western blood, but CCP of 232 is this just rheumatoid arthritis. I have a lot PG psych issues too, not from the past. Um, so I am not aware that CCP is elevated because of Lyme. Um, anti-nuclear antibodies, ANA, can be elevated from Lyme, but not, I, I haven't seen any science, I don't think anyone's done science to say whether a Lyme can trigger CCP antibodies as well too. Okay, all right. Um, good luck to you, Mosby. Hello, Robin. Good evening, Dr. Ross. Thank you for your time to do the with to uh, be with us, Limeys. My situation. I've. Um, you're welcome. Um, my situation. I've been treated for Lyme and most currently Babesia. However, my most current lab results come up with very high rheumatoid arthritis. Is this normal? I don't feel like I have RA and will not go to another specialist to only find out again. I don't have what my lab showed. What do you suggest uh, being I feel the best I have in years considering I still do have some neuropathy and my eyes get strange, maybe due to inflammation? All right, so um, the blood testing that we that you may be talking about um, in when we look at uh, blood tests that we look at to see if you might have rheumatoid arthritis is a blood test called a rheumatoid factor, which is um, an immune reaction test, okay? It's not totally specific for rheumatoid arthritis, all right? When we make a, um, meaning other things might trigger that to be elevated. It could be that Lyme is triggering it to be elevated. When you make a diagnosis of any of the inflammatory arthritis, whether it's lupus, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, um, uh, whether it um, is um, Sjodren's syndrome, what, whatever kind of inflammatory arthritis conditions we make diagnosis of, we have to look at a number of things. We consider what does testing tell us. We also consider what do your symptoms tell us. And we consider what does the physical exam tell us, okay? So just having a positive rheumatoid factor test does not mean you have rheumatoid arthritis. You have to have some physical exam findings that fit the picture. And you also need to have some symptoms that fit the picture as well too, okay? All right. So it may be you don't have enough of those other things, which is why they've said you don't have rheumatoid arthritis before. And I can tell you anti-nuclear antibodies and rheumatoid factors that we test for can be triggered to be elevated because of Lyme, not because you have rheumatoid arthritis and not because you have lupus, for instance. OK. All right. And then. Um, So I'm not, I'm not sure what, uh, I don't fully understand the rest of your question there, but, uh, but what I would say is don't rely on a rheumatoid factor itself to indicate that you have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Lyme can trigger those to be elevated. And the only way you should be diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis is if you have enough symptoms of it and you have enough joint findings of it, then you might say you have rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Robin. Hello, Carter. Let's see. After my tick bite, I have more pale white skin that does not tan. Is there some type of biologic change that happens to skin cells? Hmm. You know, I haven't seen that happen before, Carter. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I'm not. I'm, it may be in you. There has been some changes. I would say it's not a typical thing that I have seen with people that get tick bites, though. OK. All right. Good luck to you, Carter.
Hello, Brandy. Let's see. What is the mechanism cause for inability to process carbs? Seem like lots of people can no longer handle alcohol or high carb foods, regardless of gluten. What if your what is your theory? What is going on? Does some necessary gut species get killed off or what? All right. So what I see in my practice, Brandy, is that if somebody starts having a lot of alcohol intolerance or carb intolerance or sugar intolerance, it often is a sign of having too many yeast growing in the intestines. And too many yeast are growing in the intestines if the antibiotics have disturbed the good um, gut microbiome and decreased the amount of healthy bacteria that are there, okay? Um, other signs that can indicate too many yeast could be sugar cravings, um, could be increased food sensitivities, um, could be a gassiness and bloating and females, vaginal yeast and vaginal um, discharge can indicate that, vaginal itching can indicate that. Um, sometimes having difficulty swallowing because um, if you get yeast, sometimes it actually be up in the food pipe. So things will catch as you swallow. Those are some things that can happen from having um, too many yeast as well too, okay? But this picture is usually something I see with too many yeast. And the ultimate cause is you've knocked down good bacteria in your gut, okay? All right. Uh, good luck to you. Hello, Heidi. I say, hi, Dr. Ross. My son has been sick for 15 months with Lyme, which went undiagnosed for the first six months. He was on antibiotics, a tovacone for a few months starting in January, then switched to Zysulfram, which he was on for almost 4.5 to 5 months. He was making good progress, but seemed to peak and then got worse over the summer. We recently decided to have him tested through Igenix recently, which showed additional infections for Bartonella, babesiosis, and tick-borne relapsing fever. Could the disulfiram have helped fight any of the additional tick-borne illnesses? He is currently on azithromycin and doxycycline. I am hoping that he can get back to the atovacone as I feel he still has active babesiosis and many Bartonella symptoms. What is the best medication treatment to fight babesiosis and Bartonella? Do you teach to treat tick-borne relapsing fever the same as Lyme. Okay, all right, those are all good questions, okay? So I wanna say one thing to begin with. Um, disulfiram does not treat Bartonella, okay? Uh, in fact, so everyone, disulfiram is, uh, many of, I think of you are now familiar with disulfiram, but for those of you that aren't, um, disulfiram is also known as antabuse. It's a drug that we previously used to treat alcoholism because if alcoholics uh, take disulfiram, it would make them sick, uh, nauseated, throwing up sick, bad headaches sick if they drink alcohol. So we use it as a deterrent in alcoholics, okay? It was discovered about five years ago now by um, Dr. Rahadas in his lab at um, Stanford University that it had the potential based on their lab experiments um, to kill uh, persister forms of Lyme and then subsequently they did other studies that show that it has some ability to kill growing state of Lyme, but it's not the strongest killer of it, okay? So um, many of us uh, have been using disulfiram to treat persisters, but I have to tell you, it may not be a strong killer of growing forms of Bartonella, okay? So my, uh, of Lyme, I'm sorry. So let me talk terminology here. So the Lyme germ and Bartonella both have growing state and they have hibernating persister states, okay? Maybe 90% of the germs are growing and about 10% are in these hibernating persister forms. When we started discovering these persisters years ago, we started thinking maybe we've been missing getting at these persisters. Our antibiotics have done a good job on the growing side, but maybe we weren't good enough about getting at persisters because the lab experiments told us that the standard antibiotics don't work for these uh, persisters, okay? So we all started trying to do things to go with persisters. One of the bigger drugs that many of us were trying is disulfiram, okay? Now, the data on disulfiram is this. Um, this is based on uh, some studies that were done by Dr. Leitner in his practice in uh, Pennsylvania. And this mirrors what I see in my practice too. If a person is on a disulfiram alone treatment for the Lyme germ, not Bartonella, not Bambesia, but the Lyme germ, if they're on a disulfiram only treatment, 
about 30% to 35% of people can get into remission. Okay. All right. But that means that a whole huge bunch don't. Okay. And so many of us were trying this because we thought it was going to be the wonder drug, but it's not. And, and it has a lot of side effects. Uh, part of the reason it may not affect everyone well for the Lyme infection is that it's not the strongest killer of growing Lyme. So if I've had somebody who did well on disulfiram but didn't get all the way there, sometimes what I'll do for the Lyme germ is repeat disulfiram again, but also have them in on an on antibiotic at the same time that also treats growing Lyme. Okay. Now, Bartonella, laboratory experiments three years ago on Johns Hopkins University showed that disulfiram does nothing for Bartonella. Okay. The other thing that disulfiram has some weak ability to handle is Babesia, but it is not a strong killer of Babesia, okay? So I rarely these days use disulfiram alone. I'm usually going to use it and combine it uh, with something to go after growing Lyme and use it as my persister agent. If I've got somebody that has Babesia, I want to get them more on standard Babesia treatments that don't use disulfiram, and then we need to design something entirely different to go after um, Bartonella, okay? So when I have somebody these days that has Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia, a treatment that I'm starting to do um, or have been doing for about the last six months and seeing some good benefit is to do um, uh, a macrolide like clarithromycin or azithromycin. Um, and that would be for the uh, clarithromycin in adult dose would be 500 milligrams twice a day, azithromycin one pill a day. And I would use diflucan too. I mentioned diflucan earlier for Bartonella. Now the diflucan for Bartonella is good for growing and persister Bartonella. Clarithromycin or azithromycin with diflucan is a full Bartonella treatment. It does those clarithromycin and azithromycin do a good job of going after growing Bartonella, okay? In addition, the azoles like uh, fluconazole um, and the other one being metronidazole, which is flagyl, and another one called tinidazole, those are good cyst busters for the growing form of Lyme. And the clarithromycin, azithromycin treat the spirochete form of, of Lyme, okay? Um, but these are for the growing state. We still have to do something for persister Lyme. All right, and what you could do for persister Lyme would be to do a liposomal cinnamon, clove, oregano capsule, uh, one pill twice a day, and that will pick up your persisters. It's a natural treatment. It, uh, Johns Hopkins experiments show us that that is a good job. And in addition, that liposomal cinnamon, clove, oregano also um, kills persister Bartonella. Keep in mind, you're already beyond diflucan to do that, okay? And then finally, the Babesia treatment I would add in malarone. Malarone has both a tovaquone in it, but also a quinine derivative called proquinel. And I would do one pill twice a day. And the clarithromycin or azithromycin I mentioned earlier also helps with that as well too. So the treatment you could do that would go after all, um, uh, all appearances of Lyme, which is the spirochete and the cyst appearance, and also go after growing and persisting Lyme, and go after growing and persister Bartonella and go after Babesia would include clarithromycin one pill twice a day, diflucan 200 milligrams one time a day, liposomal cinnamon clove oregano capsules, and malarone uh, one pill twice a day. That would be a treatment that could do all of those, okay? And that's the kind of a treatment I'm starting to do or have been doing now for about the last six months or so after I learned about diflucan um, and seem to be getting good results from that as well too, okay? All right. Um, good luck, Heidi. Good luck to your son. Hello, TJ. Skin on the tops of my hands get red and raw and burn. Is there an infection that this is seen in? Also get it around my chin. Thanks. You know, um, I haven't seen that caused by an infection per se. There are some of my patients that report with their Lyme having a lot of sun sensitivity with, um, when they're not on antibiotics, actually, where they feel like their skin is burning. And as we get their 
germs under control, that goes away but they don't see any red and rawness that's associated with it. So I haven't quite seen this in my practice before, TJ. All right, good luck to you. Hello, Mary, let's see, hi, Dr. Ross, and thank you for answering my question, you're welcome. I tried to ask you last week, but I admitted the name of the drug, so you didn't understand my question, my apologies. Um, my question is, would a dose as low as 50 milligrams of diflucan be effective for yeast candida in conjunction with 500,000 international units of nystatin? What do you feel is the minimum effective dose for most patients? Thank you again. Ah, it's a good question. Okay, now I understand. I remember your question from last week. So, you know, my general recommendation for treating um, uh, intestinal yeast overgrowth candidiasis in an adult is fluconazole 200 milligrams a day, as well as nystatin, uh, 500,000 international units, but take two of those twice a day, okay? That's what I tend to find to be the most effective dose, okay? Now, you're asking what is a minimum amount of diflucan that you can get by with, and the answer is, it all depends on the person. But 50 milligrams in an adult would be very, very small, and nystatin, that you're talking about here. Um, nystatin is a very weak yeast killer. The reason I include it with my diflucan regimens is there is the ability for um, yeast to learn resistance to diflucan, but the chances of that happening decline a lot if you have nystatin on board at the same time. Okay, so I'm not really using in my regimens, I'm not really using nystatin per se as a strong yeast killer. I'm using it to support the diflucan, okay, to be honest with you, okay? So, you know, if I were to say in my experience, some of the lowest doses I've seen work with diflucan would be 100 milligrams in an adult, coupled with uh, 1 million international units of uh, nystatin twice a day, which would be two of the 500,000 uh, international unit pills. Okay. So uh, to answer your question directly, I don't know 50 milligrams going to do it. I've, I've seen benefit happening often at a hundred milligram dose, but I'm not clear that 50 milligrams would do it. If you are going to try that, I would suggest that you, um, if you're going to try to 50 milligrams, I would definitely want that, um, nice statin up at a million units twice a day. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Mary. Hello, Pat. Hello, Dr. Ross. I appreciate these webinars uh, very much. I had several ticket. Um, good. I'm glad you're getting some benefit out of them. I see. I've had several tick attachments over the years and more recently have had shin pain, pain on the soles of my feet and a rash. So I had myself tested. The Galaxy Bartonellum serum test was positive for all four species of Bartonella. I also did the Igenix Lyme test and was negative. Is it possible to have a Lyme co-infection without Lyme? Could I have had Lyme and cleared it with two antibiotic pills they give you at the walk-in clinic? Also, I live in New York and had to jump through hoops to get the Galaxy test. Why is it not available in New York? A doctor told me the Galaxy must be a scam because NY has one of the highest tick populations. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, that's an interesting response. All right, so Galaxy, all right, so, um, in New York State has um, its own unique set of laws regarding testing, all right? So um, independent labs like Galaxy and Igenix have to get approval through the new, I think it's the New York State Health Department to be able to offer their test. And I'm not sure if Galaxy tried to get it done or if they um, um, tried and were rejected. I, I don't know what happened there, okay? But I wanna let you know that New York is unique in that it has to have, uh, it, it, the state health department um, has to approve testing of any independent labs before they're offered in the state. That's not the case in every state in the country. Like here in Washington state, the, they don't, uh, the health department here does not give approval for who and what labs can be offered within the state to state residents, but it is unique to New York state, okay? Galaxy Labs is a legitimate lab. Um, I want you to know that. Um, 
they, um, and that's my experience working with them and looking at how they run their lab. I think it's a legitimate lab as well, too. They do, I believe, have independent verification of quality through outside organizations that have certified them. Um, but uh, New York State is its own animal. <laughs> I just want you to know that, okay? All right, so in terms of the, um, so the Galaxy test, right, so the answer to your question, you know, Bartonella is an infection that um, can be obtained without getting Lyme. In fact, it can be obtained from not even a tick bite. It can be obtained from fleas. It can be obtained possibly from mites. It can be obtained through other vectors. And in fact, the science showing that it is transmitted um, in Lyme is actually controversial as to whether it truly is or not, or if people that have Lyme are getting their Bartonella another way, and it just happens to activate when they have Lyme, okay? So I just want you to know, it's it's not uh, uh, a slam dunk that it um, is, when a person has it and they had a tick bite, that they actually got it from the tick, or did they get it through other means, okay? But it's a significant factor, okay? And your symptoms of shin pain, pain on the soles of your feet, and the rash you described, I would have been thinking test for Bartonella or treat for Bartonella just by that, okay? So it doesn't surprise me that came back positive. Uh, but to answer your question, you can have Bartonella alone, okay? All right. Now, in terms of the your question about uh, was the two doxycyclines that you got in the emergency room adequate to get rid of Lyme? The answer is maybe, but I question it. <laughs> so let's look at that real quick. Okay, so when you treat Lyme disease, uh, what we're trying to do is prevent you, when we treat you for a tick bite, we're trying to prevent you from getting Lyme disease, okay? The Infectious Disease Society of America um, in their guidelines currently has a guideline that says for an acute tick bite, if you got your tick and it was attached in a Lyme endemic area, an area where there's a lot of Lyme, that you should get doxycycline two pills one time, okay? That's their guideline. And they developed that guideline based on one study, one, one study. Okay, so that's an inadequate amount of science to make any recommendation, but they still chose to go forward with it. Okay, now there's a problem with their study. In what their study was, is they looked to see did, if you got doxycycline two pills at the time of your tick bite and you didn't have any symptoms at first, and then, um, and then what they wanted to see was did taking the doxycycline prevent you from getting a, um, going on and developing the bullseye rash? Okay, that was what their endpoint was. They didn't study about whether it prevented you three months, four months down the road from getting fatigue or joint pain or brain dysfunction. No, they only looked at one thing, which was the prevention of getting the Lyme rash. Okay, so who knows? Who knows if there, and, and it, is, it is true that people that took their doxycycline did not get the, um, the Lyme rash. And so therefore their conclusion was, aha, this must stop Lyme disease, but we don't know. They, di they didn't really look adequately at the other endpoints. For that reason, most of us that treat chronic Lyme disease advocate for when you have a tick bite in a Lyme endemic area and you have no symptoms at first, that at a minimum, you use doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for at least 21 days, okay? That's what I recommend as well, too. Um, there's some my, mice studies um, that show us that that does do a good job of preventing you from getting chronic Lyme disease, okay? We don't have human studies, though, that show that, okay? All right. So anyhow, the, to make a comment on that, and then let's see. You know, I think I have, oh, I think you asked about Rocky Mountain spotted fever or tick-borne relapsing fever. Hold on here just a minute. Nope. I think I got it. All right. There you go. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Laura. Hi, Dr. Ross. How often do you find that women in their 40s who are being treated for Lyme and co-infections need bioidentical hormone replacement? If so, do you prescribe patches? any particular name I should look for, I feel as if my symptoms are moving toward those of menopause more than Lyme and co-infections. Thank you. So um, 
I don't have an actual percentage for you um, and based on that age, but what I would tell you is this, when you have um, chronic Lyme, again, Lyme disease leads the immune system to overproduce a group of, of chemicals called cytokines, okay? And cytokines are good and bad. White blood cells make them when they see Lyme or mold toxins or too many yeast in you. And the purpose of those cytokines is to turn the immune system on. But in these situations, the immune system doesn't do a good job and it keeps trying harder and harder and it makes too many cytokines, okay? And too many cytokines make it so you can't think, disturb your sleep, give you fatigue, make you hurt all over, and, and they interfere with the correct function of an area of your brain called the hypothalamus pituitary. That area is the governor of all your hormonal systems, okay? So it's not uncommon that when we treat people with Lyme, they have dysfunction of their thyroid, some women will get dysfunction of their ovaries because the brain is not signaling correctly to the ovaries um, to make the hormones that they're supposed to, okay? So it's not uncommon, okay? In terms of uh, hormone replacement, if I am gonna do hormone replacement, I do like doing bioidentical hormone replacement. And I think you can either do that as patches, you can do that as cream, you can do that even as pills. I, I don't find a preference either way on that, okay? All right, um, good luck to you, Laura. Oh, Laura, the good news is, is if you get your Lyme under control and the cytokines go down, then that part of your brain can turn back on again and start regulating your ovaries correctly, okay? All right. Hello, Frank. Hold on here just a minute. All right, let's see. Dr. Ross, my wife's doctor ordered an IgG ELISA test from a company called Immunosciences Lab that showed positive for Bartonella. The corresponding IgM test was negative. How confident can we be that at least at some point in the past she had the infection? So um, Immunosciences does a test to measure that is an ELISA technology, okay? And ELISA technology is not as um, specific for the infection they discover as other types of technology are, okay? So by specific, I mean that when it says something is there, it's really there, okay? Um, so um, so the um, my preference, so it is possible if she had an IgG, so IgG antibodies, mean that uh, well, the way antibodies work, when you first get sick, you develop IgMs, and then um, they are supposed to um, stop being made, and then you start making IgGs. Once you make IgGs, they are the memory of the immune system, and so having IgGs means either an infection is still in you or it was in you in the past, okay? Technically, that's what IgGs mean. The question is, is the ELISA method of detecting them accurate? And it may be correct, but a more a better way to make sure about uh, correctness here would actually be to do the immunoblot, uh, which is a better technology uh, through Igenix. And they have a sensitivity on their study of about 90%, I believe, meaning if it's there, they can find it 90% of the time and a specificity of about 95%, meaning it's accurate when they find it. Okay, all right. So, I mean, yeah, IgG could mean that it is old, or still in you, it could be either way, okay? All right, thanks for your question, Frank. Good luck to you. Hello, Paula. I've been on azithromycin and ampicillin for the past month for Bartonella. Now I have insomnia. Is it a side effect or a cytokine storm going on? I don't have any other Herx reactions. So um, I don't know. Um, let me let me give you some things to consider, and I, I would talk with your doctor about this as well, too. Okay, so it is true, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, if you have excess cytokines, they can disturb your sleep centers. Okay, so I can see why you would be wondering about that. 
And if you've been on antibiotics for a short period of time, it could be that you still are having cytokine surges as a result of killing the germs, or we call that Herxheimer reactions, okay? Getting about a month out, though, you usually would expect some of your uh, your Herxheimer reactions to be going away, okay? The other consideration would be, is there something you're taking that's triggering the insomnia? And I would assume if you're doing azithromycin and ampicillin, you may also be working with an, a doctor that's also working with some supplements in you. And you might want to take a look at those to see if any of the supplements have a side effect of insomnia. If you are not taking any supplements and you're having insomnia, it could be that you are having an atypical reaction to the azithromycin or ampicillin um, as a side effect uh, of one of those giving insomnia, although I would say that's not typical, okay? But I have a rule of medicine, and you, if you've been on my webinars before, you know it, and uh, that rule of medicine is anything can happen to anyone with anything. And I've seen some crazy side effects that have happened when I'm managing my Lyme patients, and the way I start looking for a side effect is something changes that I know is not normal, and it only happened after we introduced drug X or drug Y or supplement X or supplement Z. And so what I'll do is remove the last thing I added, and if their symptoms get better, then I know it was an uncommon side effect of that thing, okay? So what I would say is about a month out, I, if this was all Herx, I wouldn't expect you still to be having Herx and uh, the increased cytokines triggering sleep disturbance. So I would wanna look at everything that you're taking, including the supplements, and maybe consider an abnormal atypical reaction to the azithromycin or ampicillin, okay? All right, talk it over with your doctor though, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Paul. Hello, Becca. Hi, Dr. Ross. At some point now or at a later date, I'd like to know what you think of 3,3-diandomethane to treat Borrelia burgdorferi. Research is by Yan Jin Zhu and Cindy Lee, University of Toronto in October of 2022. I don't know what to think about it. Thank you for bringing that one to my attention. That's new research, obviously. Um, Let's see here. Let me, let me add that to my growing list of things to look into. Y'all are keeping me on my toes tonight. Um, let's see here. Thanks, Peg. I'll have to look into that one. Okay. All right. Hello, Paula. Let's see. Does Bartonella and Candida cause undigested food in the stool? Or could it be H. pylori? I've been on Nysantin for two months and the Candida diet. Um, so if you're having undigested food in, or when, if somebody comes to me and they're having undigested food, um, I wanna know, um, are they, is their pancreas making enough digestive enzymes? Okay, um, the, and, and there's two ways that I would go about it. First of all, I might, now the reason that the pancreas, so the pancreas is an organ that many of you know makes insulin, but it also makes enzymes that help break down food. If um, you have, uh, and, and the pancreas re receives signals from healthy bacteria that line the intestines to tell it to make those enzymes, okay? So sometimes if you have a lot of dysbiosis, meaning abnormal bacteria growing there from having been on antibiotics and you have too many yeast in your intestines, the pancreas may not receive correct signals to make enough enzymes to digest food, and then you start getting um, uh, undigested food in the toilet, okay? So there's two ways to go. One is I might have my patients just do a trial of digestive enzymes. And a product that is a good digestive enzyme product is a product called Similase by Integrative um, Therapeutics. And you would do one or two before meals three times a day. See if it makes a difference, okay? That's one way. That's the 
kind of the, the non-scientific way of doing it, meaning uh, you don't have proof that, that, that you have uh, pancreatic dysfunction, but it's a way of testing it is to give the thing that we would give you, okay? Another option that you would have to work with a physician on this one is to get a stool study done. And in that stool study, they would be looking at the makeup of the good bacteria and bad bacteria in your intestines. They would also be doing some testing, looking at some of the um, uh, pancreatic enzymes to see, are they being made enough, okay? And the big one that often is looked at on those stool studies is something called um, a pancreatic elastase. If it is low, it means that you have pancreatic dysfunction, probably coming from dysbiosis in the gut. Okay. All right. So different studies that you could do on that one would be something like a GI map. We'll look at that. Uh, another stool study you could do would be... Um, uh, Genova Diagnostics has a um, stool panel that would look at such things like that. Um, Great Plains has a stool uh, panel that would look like that. Doctors Data has a comprehensive stool panel that would look at all those things, okay? But you could get some idea by looking at a comprehensive stool study as to whether you're having pancreatic dysfunction as well, too, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Paula. Oh, the Genova test is called a GI effects panel. Hello, Amanda. Let's see, I've tested positive for Lyme plus co-infections and have bold mycotoxins as well. Lately, I am seeing red spots spreading from my legs up now to my torso. They are red and some are small black spots filled with blood. I am really concerned about the spreading and what it means. Um, so Amanda, I, it would be helpful if I could actually see them. So just so you know, but uh, one thing I would suggest, um, given what's happening here, is I would want to look to make sure that you have an adequate amount of platelets in your blood to stop bleeding. And I would also want to, and so the way you would check for that is to get something called a complete blood count or a CBC. I would want to know what's happening with liver and kidney function. You could do something called a CMP, Comprehensive Metabolic Profile. If the liver is dysfunctioning, sometimes it won't make adequate blood clotting proteins, okay? So at a minimum, those would be some things I would think about doing. I will let you know that Bartonella and Babesia sometimes give these small, what I'll call cherry hemangiomas, little red spots, but they have a specific look. And, and unfortunately, I don't get, I can't look at your skin <laughs> this way. So if I could look at them, I might even say you don't necessarily need the blood studies. If I could see what they look like and tell you whether that looks like a Babesia spot or a Bartonella spot. But the way you're describing this makes me want to look at your CBC to check platelet levels and do some kidney liver um, testing as well, too. I might do some blood clotting studies, something called a PTT and something called an AP. Um, APTT. So PT and an APTT. All right, there you go. <laughs> Too many initials there, but anyhow, there you go. Okay. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Good luck to you. Hello, Frank. Is there a way to tell the difference between shortness of breath from anxiety and air hunger from Bartonella? You know, a lot of, so there's not a test you can do if that's what your question is. But a lot of that is something I kind of surmise based on the history that I'm getting from my patients. So I'll, I want to query them and find out specifically when are they feeling short of breath? At the time they feel short of breath, do they feel anxious? Often the um, air hunger that people get with Bartonella or even with Babesia is something that comes on spontaneously and at first has no anxiety associated with it. Now, I understand feeling short of breath or having air hunger can be anxiety provoking. I get that. But sometimes you can kind of tease out. I can tease out by the history what came first, the anxiety, which then led to the air hunger or air hunger, which then led to the anxiety. Okay, so it's kind of a, um, you have to look at what the history tells you on that one. Okay, all right. Uh, good luck to you, Frank.
Hello, Andrew. So you do have any patients on Trental for vascular inflammation, uh, circulation, fibrin nest degradation? How could this drug compare to Baluki and lumbrokinase? You know, I have, it's been, it's been since my family practice days um, of using Trental. So I haven't acted as a family physician since uh, 2000. <laughs> so bear with me, man. I have to, I have to look up the actions of how Trental works real quick. My initial thinking as I'm looking this up is that it's not going to be a direct substitute for the enzymes of lumbar kinase and of, um, and of serapeptase. Okay, so what it does is it um, lowers blood viscosity or thickness and improves the flexibility of erythrocytes, okay? But it is not, it does not degrade fibrin, okay? So fibrin, um, so although, though, so Trental, if somebody's got um, a lot of uh, claudication or poor blood flow to the extremity, so when they walk, they start getting a lot of muscle cramping, um, it could help in those situations, okay? The Trental can, and that's what we use it for traditionally. But in terms of your question about can it help with the, the situations of inflammation causing circulation problems and even these fiber and nest and, and Lyme, no, it's probably not going to help with those. So when you have Lyme, um, your immune system can sometimes be triggered to make excess amounts of blood clotting protein called fibrin. And that fibrin can start um, clogging up your blood vessels. It thickens, I'm sorry, your blood, it thickens it up, makes it so it doesn't flow as smoothly, okay? The other thing that, excuse me, fibrin can do in Lyme is it can mix with your Bartonella and your Babesia germs to, call, to form nest of germs that are kind of wrapped in and around these fibrin fibers. And you want to deal with that and to deal with the thickening of the blood um, leading from, from excess fibrin, the thing that would work best on both of those is not the Trental, but it would be Baluki uh, lumbar kinase or lumbar kinase, which a brand of lumbar kinase is Baluki. You can also get lumbar kinase um, by a company called Allergy Research that's uh, cheaper and does just as well too, okay? And I usually have people take at least one pill uh, twice a day on that, okay? All right, um, good luck. Hello, Chris. Let's see. Since being bitten by a tick when I was 21, I've struggled with erectile dysfunction. It does not appear to be hormone related. It's a mystery that I can't figure out. Do you have any helpful remedies or deficiencies to address in this department? Sadly, nobody talks about this part of Lyme. Based on symptoms and blood tests, it appears as if I have Lyme and BART. Any help would be amazing. Thank you. Okay. So the one thing, if you're having erectile dysfunction that um, um, at, I don't know what your age is, but if you're having it, um, there's one of the things you want to see is, um, do you have good neurologic function and blood flow to your penis? Okay. And in, in a quick and dirty way that we kind of look at this is um, most men uh, will have an erection first thing in the morning. You develop an erection to help from urinating, basically. It allows you to, if, you're, if your a penis is erect, it makes it harder for urine to flow out of your bladder, okay? And for you to have that morning uh, erection that most men have, um, you have to have correct blood flow and neurologic function of the penis, okay? So your ability to have an erection is actually determined by the, the innervation of the penis, as well as the blood flow to the penis, um, as well as uh, there can be some hormone component, but it's not the major cause of it, okay? The other thing that determines whether you can get an erection is um, um, beyond the morning erection is if you 
um, are, are actually stimulated enough uh, emotionally, uh, mentally stimulated enough, erotically stimulated, I guess is the word I'm looking for, that would lead to an erection. And so um, that, that could be a factor as well too. To see if you have if, if you are not having morning erections, then the next step would be to talk, have a visit with a urologist where they, there are some things they can do to check out blood flow, uh, make sure there isn't a blood flow abnormality to your penis, but also uh, is there um, neurologic dysfunction of the penis as well too. In terms of Lyme and Bartonella, both can lead to neuropathies, all right? And rarely that neuropathy may impact the function of your penis, basically. In that case, you know, if the neurologist says they can't find anything, then um, the other thing to do is treat your Lyme and Bart. And often I will see that erections will come back again. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Chris. The other thing if um, that I'm not sure if you've tried, you're probably aware of this, but medicines like a Cialis or a Viagra can sometimes be helpful. Um, there are also injectables you can do that cause your penis to get erect. Um, and so these are things to consider uh, while you're waiting for the Lyme and Bart to be treated, to be taken care of as well, too. And the urologist can help you look at those. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Pat. Hello, Dr. Ross. I appreciate these webinars very much. I have had several tick attachments over the years and more recently um, have had shin pain, pain on the soles of my feet and rash. Oops, we already we already went through that one. Um, sorry, um, let me, um, so I, I see you asked that twice. Anyhow, I'm sorry, read it again, people. Let me get this one out of here. Uh, again, good luck to you, Pat. Hello, Margo. Let's see. Bart and Alan Catsclaw. Good evening, Dr. Ross. My Bart symptoms are anxiety, high blood pressure, burning feet. Will this alone help these symptoms? What results can I expect? Thank you. Um, so, um, Catsclaw is not an, a, an agent I would use to treat Bartonella. What I would use to treat Bartonella um, are the herbs Houtania. Sita Acuda, and I would also use oregano cinnamon oil. I would, I'm sorry, liposomal cinnamon clove oregano. I would include the cinnamon clove oregano to treat persister state of Bartonella, and the Houtania Sita Acuda I would use to treat the growing phase of Bartonella, okay? Now, getting the germ under control often will help Bart symptoms like anxiety and burning feet to resolve, okay? The additional things you could do to help with that while you're waiting for treating the germs to work would be to lower inflammation, and that would be to use a curcumin. And I like using a product by Thorne called Mariva 500, and that's a 500 milligram pill, one pill three times a day. That lowers inflammation, okay? The other thing you might uh, look at doing is uh, glutathione. Uh, glutathione is a very strong antioxidant that is manufactured in every one of our cells and it helps with fixed damage. Um, there's good uh, science showing that it helps with diabetic neuropathy, for instance, and I find that it is very helpful in uh, neuropathy and these infections as well, too. So you would do 400 to 500 milligrams one time a day. The product I like for that is a liposomal product made by research nutritionals called TriFortify. Uh, they've got good science showing good absorption and uh, elevated levels of glutathione when somebody takes that, okay? And so that is um, a teaspoon of their product one time a day. They have an orange and a um, watermelon flavor for that one, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Margo. Um, let me do a quick screen share here. Okay, so, um, in terms of, let me take a, I'm gonna show you my Lyme protocol. So if you're wondering, what do you use? What's a starting point for certain infections? You can take a look at my protocol. 
my protocol has different parts to it because these are all the areas I find helpful, all right? So it isn't, when you're gonna treat Lyme or Bartonella, you need to do more than just kill germs. You have to correct the problems created by those infections, okay? So I have information on sleep, diet, cytokine control, uh, being on herbs that help your body deal with stress, correcting hormone problems, being on a good multivitamin, working on detox, exercise if you can, uh, treating yeast, getting Lyme under control. And then I have this section on Bartonella and Babesia, okay? So in that Bartonella and Babesia section, I give you the option of either using supplements alone or supplements and prescriptions, okay? So the herbs that work best for Bartonella are the Houtonia, and I tell you here how to do it, and the Sita Acuda, plus the cinnamon, clove, oregano, okay? So that's the information on how you would wind up doing that, okay? All right. All right, um, good luck. Hello, Michelle. What supplement brand makes the liposomal cinnamon clove and possibly oregano, or is this oregano separate supplement? I have ADP oregano, but want to buy the cinnamon clove. Good question. Let me show it to you. So um, I'm going to do a quick screen share here. All right. So this is my supplement store. Um, you can use this for ideas of products I find helpful and, and quality products. So <laughs> if you're in, <laughs> excuse me. If you're interested in seeing what lubrokinase do I find useful, which one do I think is a good product, which one do I use on my patients, type in lubrokinase. And you'll see that I carry two products. There's the Baluki products that I mentioned earlier, and there is this allergy research product, okay? In terms of the cinnamon, clove, and oregano, let's just type in clove. And what you're gonna see is this liposomal cinnamon clove and oregano product here. And this is doctor inspired formulations, okay? It's a good product. Um, I'm finding really good success using it. It's one pill twice a day on this one, okay? All right. All right, uh, good luck to you, Michelle. Hello, Jim. Hi, Dr. Ross. I seem to have a problem with weak connective tissue. How can I make this stronger? Thanks. So the backbone of all connective tissue is collagen. And um, you know, if I've got a person I think is having a lot of connection tissue problems, I'm usually going to supplement collagen peptides. So collagen itself is a protein, probably would be digested easily in the gut. Peptides, which are small pieces of the larger collagen can be uh, formed back together to make complete collagen within the body. And I like using a product called Collagen Plus by Thorne, and I usually suggest that people take one scoop a day of that, okay? So you could give that a try, Jim, to see if it makes any difference. The other thing that can help connective tissue is vitamin C, and you might look at even doing like 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams a day on that, okay? All right. Good luck to you. So you have so you have an opinion on Infecto Labs? Yeah, I do have an opinion on Infecto Labs. <laughs> so everyone, Infecto Lab is a lab here in the United States. So there's a company called Infecto Labs America, and I believe there's an Infecto Labs that's out of Europe as well, too. Infecto Lab is doing a type of testing for tick-borne infections, uh, which relies on Ellispot testing, which is uh, Ellispot testing also is called T-cell activation testing, okay? So the way that an Ellispot test works is we um, take your blood and we pull the T white blood cells out of it. Your T white blood cells are the ones that attack germs. And then we try to see, do those T white blood cells remember uh, attacking a Bartonella or a Bambesia or a Borrelia Lyme germ, okay? The way we do that is if we're testing for Borrelia, we take Borrelia germ, uh, proteins 
and we add them into this test tube, and then we measure, do your T cells make a lot of cytokines? Okay, so it's that's how we see if they're activated, okay? Now, your T cells, the majority that are in your blood system are circulating T cells that have a lifespan of two months, All right? There also are a type, a group of T cells called T memory cells that can last months to years or longer that sometimes circulate in your blood system. So the prevailing attitude of many of these labs like Infecto labs or Armin labs that do these T cell activation tests is that your T cell activation test, Elispot, if it's positive, means that sometimes within the last two months that, that your immune system has tried to fight the infection, therefore it must be in you, okay? But they're missing the point in that if a test is positive, it may also be positive because your memory T cells that keep circulating may be causing that false positive result, even if a germ is out of you. Okay. All right. The other problem with these labs is that sometimes Infecto Lab is doing a job and Armin Labs uh, in Germany has done a good job promoting the idea that to see where you are in your test, you should just do repeat Elispot testing. What I would tell you is it's not accurate. Okay. And the reason it's not accurate to see where you are is if a test is negative, it is true that maybe you don't have any uh, circulating T cells that recognize that germ in the last two months, but the germ could still be hiding away in you, okay? And your immune system could be suppressed by Lyme because it's so active that it's not, uh, the T cells aren't reacting, okay, from immune suppression, okay? So a negative test does not mean the germ is gone. Likewise, with Elispot testing in general, there's a 15% uh, testing failure rate where you might have the infection, but the test can be negative, okay? So the other thing I would say about Infecto Labs, and this is based on my looking at their labs a couple, maybe about four months ago now, their um, Lyme test is only looking at Borrelia burgdorferi, I believe, okay? Versus the Igenix immunoblot uh, which is an antibody test, also an immune system test, but an antibody test, looks to see if you have antibodies against eight strains, okay? So their Borrelia test is more limited in, in what it can find than what the um, Igenix immunoblot is, all right? For Bartonella, the Igenix immunoblot can detect the family of 15 kinds of Bartonella versus the Infectolab is only testing, I believe, against um, a Bartonella henselite, maybe Cantana, but they're not testing against the extensive numbers of uh, Bartonella that a person can have, okay? And then more recently, I think Igenix has the superior Babesia test and that they have um, their Babesia immunoblot, which is new to them, now can detect the whole family of Babesia versus um, the I am, um, immunoblot or the uh, Elispot technology that uh, InfectoLab does is only looking, I believe, for one or two strains. So again, it doesn't look for as many strains, okay? So their testing can be wrong 15% of the time, that's InfectoLab, and they don't test for as many uh, types of infection. And I disagree with their promoting and others that promote the idea that you can use this to see where you are in treatment because it's not accurate for all the reasons I just said, okay? All right, so there you go. Um, I'm not using the lab. I still think the most reliable lab test out there for tick-borne illnesses um, are offered by Igenix, actually. And I'm not paid by Igenix to say that. That's based on my clinical experience working with them, okay? All right, and the science, what the science tells us as well, too, okay? Hello, Sandy. When do you use Interface Plus versus Lumber Kinase for biofilm busting? Or do you sometimes use them together since Interface Plus contains EDTA, which binds to heavy metals? Uh, thanks for these webinars. So in terms of enzymes, I think the enzymes that bust up biofilms, Lumber Kinase is stronger than natokinase, than serapeptase, um, and I believe the interface has some of those other enzymes in it, okay? It is true that interface does have EDTA, and that's based on the theory that, um, that biofilms, um, so biofilms, everyone, are slime layers that can cover germs. 
they are very complex structures. They have a mucus slime layer that's held together in a fibrin blood clotting protein skeleton. Within the slime, there are numerous different kinds of bacteria that all assume different kinds of functions. And, the, and, and so some of the bacteria act like the post office, some act like the shopping center. I mean, they're really complex structures. They have tubes that uh, intake nutrients and tubes that expel waste products. I mean, these are really complex structures. Um, there is a theory that if you pull heavy metals out that these structures will fall apart. What I would tell you is there's no science that supports that. I know people do it, but um, I, my, my experience is, is that probably the strongest way to go after your biofilms and your fiber nests, which are different things, is the lumber kinase alone. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Sandy. All right, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me there. I'm about ready to lose my voice. <laughs> There it is, it's back again. All right, this is it for me for tonight. We've uh, enjoyed being with you here for the last hour and a half, um, but I need to be moving on. There's a couple Basinji dogs here that need to get their evening walk in, and uh, I've got to feed myself as well too. Uh, so tonight, I will take some time to edit up the uh, recording of the webinar, and then early tomorrow morning, I'll get up and um, create a synopsis uh, that I will then send both of those out to you in the email tomorrow morning. When you get that email, there'll also be an opportunity to sign up for next week's webinar, which will be a Thursday webinar next week, okay? And um, I would appreciate if you'd share this information, these emails with others that you think may get benefit. If you're getting benefit, they're probably gonna get benefit too. So help some people, okay? and help me reach my mission to help as many people as I possibly can with Lyme disease, okay? All right. Good night, everyone. I'll see you next week.